Uh, I want to uh, frame Israel as a settler colonial project and a project that is still ongoing. Um, I am aware that you are probably more uh, informed than the publics that I usually talk to, so there might be some things that you already know, uh, but just bear with me. Um, because, yeah, I want to take you with me step by step from the, uh, in the historical context. Um, and of course, before we start, we have to come with a, at least a basic definition of settler colonialism. Um, so, col so colonialism itself is the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial control over another country and exploiting it economically. Then uh, uh, another classic definition of settler colonialism is that it is a distinct type of colonialism that functions through the replacement of indigenous populations with an invasive settler society that also over time develops a distinctive identity and sovereignty. And one central resource in this type of colonialism is control over land. So this is just to start off with one basic definition which we know what we're talking about. Um, so whenever I, um, I, I tell the story, I usually start at the end of the 19th century, so like the 1880s, 90s. And I start in Europe. Um, because in Europe there were several things happening. First, you had the rise of national ideologies and nationalism, right? You had um, um, empires, kingdoms, smaller uh, self-governing bodies, but you didn't have the nation state yet as we know them today. Um, so at the end of the 19th century, you had uh, this rising of um, national um, uh, self-definitions, uh, the idea of self-determination, that people wanted to rule themselves, they didn't want to be ruled by some faraway uh, empire. Uh, but with this, of course, came the need to define who is we, who, are, who are, is the nation, and who doesn't belong to the nation. This, of course, also really strengthened, uh, among others, anti-Semitism. Uh, the Jews were marked in Europe as not belonging to the nation. Um, so in the, a lot of these national um, uh, movements, the thought was that you cannot be both Jewish and German or Jewish and Italian, yeah? that they don't belong. So this, on the other hand, also gave rise to uh, anti-Semitism. Um, and while the majority of uh, European Jews were very much of the idea that they could be European and Jewish, um, there became, started a small minority of Zionism, right? And Zionism is an idea that um, uh, people with, uh, with Jewish ancestry, Jewish background, need a national homeland for Jews. And one of the founding fathers is Theodor Herzl. I'm sure most of you might have heard of his name. Uh, so he was like an, an, an Austrian, Austro-Hungarian, I think, um, a Jew, a, 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 how do you call it, a journalist. Um, and he was one of those people who started thinking about, like, do we belong in Europe or don't we? Uh, and um, at that time also, what was very normal, as of I'm sure <laughs> you are all aware, was colonial Id ideas of Europe uh, claiming land over uh, in other areas and thinking of themselves as, civil, as, as civilizing those in whether Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, etc. So it was also very normal to think uh, that Europeans have the right to go and claim land and settle and that it was a good thing right, for themselves and for the people they were um, uh, colonizing. And one of the great reads that I uh, did was already during my bachelor's, I had to read um, the book by Theodor Herzl. It's called Alte Neuland, so Old New Land. And it's, it's a novel. It's not a, so he also <laughs> wrote another book that's more of a manifest. But this one is a novel. And it's about a young man, a young Jewish man from Europe, who goes on a trip by boat. Um, and he goes and he, uh, it was written in 1902. Um, and he goes and he passes by uh, Palestine. He gets off, uh, first I think it's uh, Jaffa, he goes to Haifa, he goes to Jerusalem. And in it he describes, you know, again, he ha Theodor Herzl had never visited uh, Palestine at the time, but in this novel he describes how this young man arrived there and how he saw dirty Arabs, uncivilized, um, things were underdeveloped, a lot of sickness and disease. Uh, and he was really kind of uh, in shock by how, you know, this holy land was in such dire and bad situation. Um, and then he continues to his journey, I think it was uh, to the south of Africa, I think. And 20 years later, he wants to return to Europe, and again he passes by Palestine. Now during this 20 uh, year period, uh, Jewish migration had developed in Palestine, and he'd heard about it, but he wanted to see for himself what Jewish migration did. So he goes there and he says, wow, like it all changed. Um, you see people in nice Western suits. Uh, a lot of people there speak German because German was considered at that time as the, the language of civilization, of education, of, uh, of, of knowledge. 
um, you have uh, hospitals, uh, the streets are clean, uh, even the Arabs um, uh, know how to speak English all of a sudden. And he discusses how Jewish migration has elevated Palestine, right? So I think just reading this book shows you how Zionism is very much founded on colonial thinking that was very uh, normal at that time in Europe. Um, and this is also the founding idea, I think, of the Zionist movement in the beginnings, right? Like we have the right to migrate and claim the land and we are bringing civilization uh, as Europeans, um, Jewish, but very much European. And even la later also in Israel, Zionism remained uh, seen as the, an ideology, a political ideology that was very European in its essence. Um, yeah, so that again, so I do recommend uh, the reading of Alto Nolan. It's kind of, um, it's interesting, it might be sometimes infuriating, but it's good to see, you know, how the thinking was at the time when Zionism became a very strong ideology. And as I said, it was really a minority of Jewish people in, in Europe that uh, thought of Zionism as a good thing, but because of the rise of anti-Semitism, more and more uh, Jews were also convinced, well, maybe we do need to leave. Then the founding fathers uh, of Zionism started to discuss different options. Palestine was one option, it wasn't the only one. But first, it gained popularity because of this historic uh, tie, the religious ties, that uh, the, the religious meaning of, of the land of Israel and the different religious um, uh, areas, but also because the British wanted to support them and Palestine was one option that they also uh, suggested. Okay, so we're gonna go and move a few decades later, uh, the First World War. Um, you, had the first, yeah, you had the First World War and you had the British and the French on one side and you had the Ottoman Empire uh, with some other countries on the other side. And also in that region you had movements for self-determination, right? So also there the areas were tired of the Ottoman Empire. So what the British did was I tell the, uh, the, 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 the Arabs of the whole region, if you fight with us against the um, um, the Ottomans, we will give you uh, your own uh, state, or at least yeah, self-determination. Um, they did, but of course, I think, again, not surprising, after the First World War, <coughs> the British and the French, instead of giving um, the land back, they uh, decided to divide uh, between them. Um, yeah, right? So we have that, and then at this point also, you have the, the Balfour Declaration, which I'm sure is not unfamiliar. Uh, why I think is what is really important for me, what's really amazing for me was to learn that Mr. Balfour himself, uh, this British official, he was very much against British migra uh, Jewish migration from Russia to England at the time, uh, who wanted to escape the pogroms, but he was very much in favor of bringing them to Palestine. So again, you can see that even those who supported a Jewish national homeland were often anti-Semitic in themselves and other uh, things that they were doing. Um, I would just want to discuss, um, maybe 1936, so you had Jewish migration on one hand, but you also had the, the Palestinians who, were, who saw the colonial rule, had the British mandate as invasive. So in 1936, you had the Arab revolt, um, which was in essence an anti-colonial uh, struggle against the British, uh, which um, the British also very uh, violently um, suppressed. We even have songs about um, leaders of the revolt uh, who were executed by the British at that time. I can sing it to you later. Um, but I don't want to give you the whole history, but we all know that this was kind of the start. Uh, and then you have 1948, uh, the establishment of the Israeli state after the, the War of Independence, aka uh, the Nakba, the catastrophe, uh, where for more than 500 Palestinian towns were destroyed and the majority of Palestinians uh, became refugees. They were deported um, uh, or left to uh, the, um, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, the West Bank, and Gaza. So as I said in the beginning, in a settler colonial state, the control is over land, or the dispute is over control over land. But because Israel was set up as a Jewish national homeland, it was very important that this land was also controlled. So where in other colonial rules, it was enough to just have the bosses or the officials be of one, uh, be the British or the French, and the, uh, the, the local population could be there with a Jewish national homeland. Uh, and that's the definition, that's the, the, the reason why uh, the, the need uh, for the state it was important that the majority of people were also Jewish. And in the whole history of the 75 years, Israel has imp uh, imposed laws, policies, uh, and just practical um, steps to make sure that the land is ethnically cleansed of Palestinians. Um, so one thing that they did, for example, was in uh, 1952, Israel held the census. It was four years after the establishment uh, of the state. 
where so you had a minority of Palestinians who still remained within the borders of, the, of Israel, uh, but many people who became refugees also tried to come back to their homes. So what Israel <coughs> did was uh, they started a, a census, so they counted the Palestinians who were still inside, uh, and they were given Palesti uh, Israeli citizenship. Uh, and what that did was that it gave Israel also the mandate to whoever who didn't, who wasn't counted on that day on the census, uh, could be labeled as infiltrator and deported back abroad. Uh, and at the same time, they could also, of course, show the world that they were using democratic instruments, like, look, we are giving citizenship to everyone in the, in the country, so we are a democratic state. But again, it also gave them a way to, uh, to prevent others, the Palestinians, uh, from uh, returning to their homes. Um, the second thing that they did was, of course, they needed more Jewish people, because a lot of European Jews who migrated to Israel uh, before, or before, like to Palestine, and after the establishment of the state, many of them continued their migration to the US and Canada. Of course, many also stayed, but it wasn't enough. So in the 50s, you had also a Jewish migration from the Arab world uh, and the Middle East, so like Iraq, Iraq uh, Tunisia, uh, Egypt. But you also see this discussion throughout the whole political history of Israel, um, internal uh, discussions on who is considered Jewish. And you have the more religious conservative uh, Israeli parties who really want to hold on to a conservative definition um, of who can be considered Jewish and who then has the right to uh, migrate to Israel or uh, use the, the law of return, they call it, right? That any person with Jewish, uh, who is Jewish can come to Israel and get citizenship. But other political parties, they recognize that they cannot be so picky. We need more people, right? So they wanted to broaden the definition of who is Jewish. So it didn't necessarily have to be only your mother directly, but it could also be if you have a parent or a grandparent who was Jewish or if someone converted. Um, so you see that in the 1970s, there was a big um, rush of uh, Soviet, Soviet migrants. Um, and there again was a big discussion in Israel because they came and they ate pork and they had Christmas trees and then there was discussion like are they really Jewish or not. But again it was more and less important depending on the demographic needs of the state. Um, then you have uh, different projects that Israel committed. It's called the, uh, one of them is the Judaization of the Galilee. So the Galilee is an area within Israel nowadays but it has a majority of Palestinians still. So Israel had an official policy of Judaization of the Galilee, so trying to build as many settlements, uh, Jewish settlements, as possible among the Palestinian settlements so that they don't remain uh, the majority. The same thing in the Naqab, which is the southern region, uh, where you had a lot of, uh, of Bedouin uh, villages. They really roamed the land. Israel tried to um, contain them in five towns so that they wouldn't uh, be um, in other places, so in Israel confiscated most of the land and started to build small Israeli settlements everywhere. And you have one town there, a village, it's called Da'araqib. Um, and I did some research on it a long time ago, but by now I think it was destroyed already more than 100 times, where the Palestinians keep on building their homes and then Israel comes with bulldozers and destroys them in an effort to try and let them move to one of those five designated towns. And then another thing that Israel does is uh, what um, um, uh, human rights organizations call the silent deportation of Jerusalemites. So Jerusalem is, of course, a very contentious uh, region. Palestinians in Jerusalem, um, they don't have citizenship, they have a uh, residency. So they have Israeli residency, but not citizenship. And their residency can be revoked uh, if they cannot uh, show that their center of life, it's called, is in Jerusalem. Which means that if you were born in Jerusalem, your parents and grandparents, etc., your home is there. But if you move abroad to study, for example, for three years or more, or if you have to leave, or if you just cannot prove that you live there in a house, you don't have the bills to show that you live there, Israel can revoke your residency and you can be prevented from entering uh, the city. And we're, of course, all familiar with settlements in, at the West Bank that have been built. So again, we can see very much how Israel is really trying to, uh, to clear the deck, to have control over the land, but clear them. Uh, from the Palestinian people and fill them in with uh, mainly uh, Jewish people. Um, and um, yeah, how it's still ongoing and it's doing it by using law. Um, so I think I, I, I teach uh, law students and I think for me it's really important to always show them that we might think that law is, is an, instru an, an objective or a neutral instrument, but law is always made by the powerful, right? To impose uh, things that are yeah, um, beneficial to only one group on the expense of the other. So I'll take one more minute uh, to, to finalize. Um, uh, that is that one can, of course, only uphold uh, such a, an exclusive national, religious, ethnic state 
um, if it implements apartheid policies, right, where one group is, is treated other than the other group. And this is also what a lot of in-depth research has shown. One of those is uh, by Human Rights Watch, which issued a report called uh, A Threshold Crossed, Israeli Authorities and the Crimes of Apartheid and Persecution. And in it, the report states that the fragmentation of the Palestinian population, uh, and they mean the, the fragmentation where you have Palestinians in Gaza, the West Bank, in Israel, the refugees, of course, um, this is in part deliberately engineered through Israeli restrictions on movement and residency, and it furthers the goal of domination and helps obscure the reality of the same Israeli government repressing the same Palestinian population um, to varying degrees and in different areas for the benefit of the same Jewish-Israeli dominant group. So I think what the valuable thing is here is to, show, to, to really see the different policies that Israel is implementing in different ways is part of the same settler colonial system. Um, and it also includes, and it really discusses, consciously ignoring the plight of the refugees, because refugees are often not discussed when talking about a future Palestinian state, for example. Uh, but here they say even ignoring the right of return of Palestinian refugees should always be part of seeing, uh, seeing it of the same apartheid practice. The report also states that Israel um, often uses security as an excuse or pretext, which we have also seen. And I would agree, uh, argue that indeed, when the nature of the state and the reason for its existence is that it's a state for the Jewish people or for the Jewish nation, then merely being non-Jewish in this context can be seen as a threat, right, uh, to the state security. So you are threatening the state security because of your non-Jewishness. And this is what makes them a threat. So here arises the question, how could then a settler colonial state that aims at domination of one group over a chunk, big chunk of land at the expense of another group not to be complicit in crimes of apartheid. And more uh, recently, of course, uh, the continuation of genocide on the Palestinian people. I think I'll stop here then. Thanks, Dina, for the uh, brilliant explanation. I, I'm very glad you did it in uh, such a concise way. Uh, I, I, thought, I thought it was very clear. Um, before I give the floor to Janneke, I forgot to mention one more thing. Uh, so you know who's sitting in front of you. I'm Luca. I'm also a member of the International Socialists and Activists uh, located in the east of the Netherlands. And with that said, um, Janneke, the floor is yours. I'll pass you the... Can I move it? Yeah, yeah shall I use this mic or what, what's better? What's better for you? Mic. All right, cool. Yeah. So oh. This one's for the room and that's for one for... Uh, for the online listeners after this talk, right? All right. Uh, yeah, welcome everybody. It's uh, really nice to uh, to hear your talk as well, uh, Dina, and this uh, meeting on uh, how do we strengthen uh, the the solidarity movement with uh, with Palestine. And I was invited to talk a little bit more about the Dutch situation, and I will focus on the protests mainly taking pl place in the last couple of uh, of months, weeks, actually. So the current situation. And I think uh, as we speak, and uh, we have a room full here, we're, we're very glad to, to, to meet you. Uh, but as we speak, of course, in Den, uh, I think in Den Haag, there is a large demonstration taking place for the, I don't know, uh, 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 the 10th or the 12th time uh, uh, after uh, the 7th of, of, of October. And I think that is very, very healthy. Um, and the solidarity movement now, I think, even runs deeper and broader than uh, the, the, the rounds before in 2021 so, and, and, and before. So I think this is very important that in the Netherlands we saw demonstrations of 20,000 people time and again. Even one time um, uh, on a spontaneous demonstration in Utrecht, uh, I heard there were 10,000 uh, people. And we also see the sit-ins uh, occurring uh, uh, across the country. Um, so yeah, I think we're, we're in an upturn of a movement and that is uh, something that you have to be very aware of and also look very concise into how can we act to push the movement, of course, uh, further. I'll come back to that uh, in, uh, in a while. Um, bringing into this as well, I would like to talk a little bit about my work. I work in a quite conservative area in a, uh, in a, in a management school. Uh, but this is the first time, literally, that uh, colleagues are talking about Palestine or talking about politics in general. Maybe because they know that I'm an activist, they always like do this little circle around me, like, oh, let's, let's not, av uh, let's avoid talking about politics. But this is really that they're opening up their heart, um, and that they're. Uh, I can see that their consciousness is really going further than only the humane level of uh, seeing so many deaths, so many deaths. Uh, but it, it, they do see, you know, the difference between the oppressor and the oppressed. 
but it's not at a level, of course, that they understand uh, how imperialism works. So, uh, but it's, it's really interesting to see because I think this is also a sign that it runs quite deep into society, right? And that is a very stark contrast with how you know our government, our between brackets government, um, is uh, ha has responded to um, to to the situation now. I mean, Mark Rutte was probably one of the first to phone Netanyahu to say, "Yeah, I fully understand that you're doing this in your self-defense and whatnot." And then later on television, he said, "Yeah, uh, we have hardly any experience with uh, a f conflict that focuses on very ordinary people." And then he was referring to, you know, the Israeli side and not to the Palestinian side, because probably in his eyes, Palestinians are not ordinary people. Um, and then, of course, we've got uh, uh, the far right and, uh, and fascist parties such as uh, FAD uh, and PVV in particular that have always seen uh, uh, the Israeli project as a, as a you know, uh, an example of what they have in mind to do to uh, minorities in this country. And Wilders, who uh, unfortunately now won the elections, if you look, if you go to his uh, website, it's full of uh, Israeli uh, uh, flags. And I think he's visited <coughs> the country like 40 times or so. He's a huge fan of uh, of Israel. So this is very, very scary, and we have to take this extremely serious as uh, as well. Um, having said that, about the um, you know the established uh, conservative and far right uh, parties. Um, oh, I also want to mention, by the way, that um, this government is actually delivering parts to um, F, uh, the fi uh, fire no, not firefighters, that's something else, sorry, jet fighters uh, in, um, uh, in the Israeli army. So I wanted to move a little bit to, um, to uh, the, the middle left party, so to say. Um, so... Um, uh, we have to be honest that they don't have a, a, an impressive track record either of supporting the, the Palestinian cause. I mean, if you look at SP, um, had they uh, they were clear in that it is uh, the three billion euros of the Washington uh, money goes to Israel, and uh, they do acknowledge that. And also uh, that uh, I think it was Lilian Marijnes and the former uh, party uh, leader of uh, SP. Who, who actually mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, it is really weird to see the skyrocketing, um, how do you say this, uh, beurs genoteerd. Um, you know, the stock markets of uh, indeed the arm, uh, arms industry uh, shooting up uh, uh, after the 7th of, uh, of October. But what these kind of parties do, like uh, GroenLinks, P van de A and SP, they do propose the two-state uh, solution. And I think that is very problematic in itself. Um, so, um, you know, that um, it, it goes far too, far too, I only have, I'm already halfway through apparently. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the Oslo Accords, eh, which originated actually this whole uh, idea of a two-state uh, solution. But you, we need clear ideas on how to liberate Palestine and two-state two solution is not part of it. Because the two-state solution, and probably you already know this, but um, <laughs> this means basically that you have Gaza, and you have the West Bank as it is, and that would be then a one state, I mean a, a state for Palestinians. How is this going to be feasible even within capitalism? How are they going to run an economy, you know? Let alone, of course, having a neighbor with the highest tech kind of army around. So, um, you know, if you look at the West Bank, it is also literally, um, how do you say this? Um, like with like measles or so, you know, all these little pockets full of uh, settler co colonials, uh, colonialists, uh, and this is ex exactly the project of Israel. You know, that is how they conquer their their land, of course. So um, this two-state solution, uh, also for another reason, by the way, to bring in here, um, if there is seven and a half million uh, Palestinians living there. Um, and 7 million uh, Israelis in the area and 80% of the land goes to the Israelis and 20% is going to the Palestinians. This is not really an, uh, an equal solution and I'm not even talking about the refugees in the surrounding countries or the people you know, in the diaspora across the, uh, across the world. Um, sorry, I need, need my notes here. Um, so yeah, the two-state solution, I was uh, talking about that maybe a little bit too long. Let me move on to some more positive notes. Um, I think there's a growing list of um, 
grassroots movements, but also I think Partij voor de Dieren has a better stance. Bij Eén had a very good stance. I mean, they still exist, of course. Unfortunately, they didn't get a seat in, uh, in Parliament. But Extinction Rebellion, science, uh, Scientist Rebellion, they do really li uh, link the situation in, um, in Palestine, the genocide that is happening now in Gaza. They link it more explicitly to the system, and I think that is super welcome. Um, and then... Um, about the uh, the sit-ins, how long do I still have? 20 seconds. Okay, <laughs> now, I'll, I'll need another two minutes, sorry. <coughs> because I think, <coughs> sorry. I also took another minute. Yeah, yeah, I, I noticed. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, no, I think uh, the demonstrations in itself are super important, but then it moved on to uh, uh, the sit-ins uh, across the country, um, uh, following the train station actions of uh, Jewish Americans in New York and some other places in America, I think, and also insp inspired by the blockade by Extinction Rebellion. I think it started in Rotterdam, then it moved to Amsterdam and then to Utrecht, and from there on it took over, like, it spread across the country. Unfortunately, not in Maastricht, where I come from, but it, uh, in Roermond, in, uh, until uh, Groningen, uh, Enschede, uh, a lot of uh, places uh, uh, you might have not even heard of that you have uh, sit-ins uh, nowadays. And it's, I think it's very important to see this also, not only as a protest, uh, in solidarity with Palestine, but also uh, Palestine liberates us. Uh, Palest it is these these sit-ins are literally also a festival of the um, of the oppressed. Now the um, reaction from the from the right-wing press and uh, the, some some Zionist uh, groups in the Netherlands, of course, uh, you could wait for them. And uh, uh, the Telegraaf, um, a very nasty uh, and very big um, uh, a newspaper in the Netherlands published a headline uh, last uh, fri last uh, Thursday, how can you do this action to uh, call for the end of Israel during Hanukkah? Uh, Hanukkah is uh, uh, a Jewish um, uh, uh, a festival, uh, 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 holiday indeed, and, uh, and that's what they're referring to, of course, let alone, you know, the whole time and again the whole discussion about slogan from the river to the sea or you know the all the time old um, discussion also especially in the Netherlands why we're not anti-semites uh, 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 when you're uh, against uh, Zionism etc and I think you know the stance of GroenLinks and of SP does not really help uh, if uh, if we're playing for a liberated uh, Palestine I really have to wrap up now um, so, yeah, I wanted to talk also about uh, uh, the situation in the universities. There's probably also here in the audience very brave students fighting for, you know, only, uh, uh, only uh, on the recognition that this is a genocide taking place in uh, Gaza. But I'm very happy to hear your thoughts and your experiences with this uh, brick wall that you're trying to demolish, so to say. Um, I think there's very, very uh, big possibilities uh, opportunities to broaden the fight for the BDS movement here in the Netherlands. We have to seize the mo movement and by doing so, that is also fighting Wilders at the same time. So there's a lot of stake for the coming months, but I'm also very inspired and very hopeful that we can make some, uh, some, uh, some wins here. Thank you very much.